going to start by sharing my presentation. Okay, so Stuma Silver, it's an almost brand new silver and gold exploration and development company focused in the southwestern US and the first property is in Nevada. Uh, we put the property together, we put the property and the company together, I should say, back in around April. Uh, since then, we've raised $13 million in two financings and we're diligently, very diligently drilling away at our first property located in central Nevada. Uh, we had some really, really interesting and strong drill results for the first time last week that I'm gonna get into here in a little bit, uh, but it'll just be very nice to, to provide you with an overview of the company over the next 15 minutes or so. So Suma Silver, we're progressing properties in Nevada and New Mexico. The first one is in Nevada and that's our major focus right now. Uh, and really going after these prolific high grade past producing mining districts that have never seen any modern exploration. And as, as Gilbert was saying in his introduction there, you know, they say there's an old saying going way back in exploration and in mining, that's the best place to find a new mine is right next to an old mine. So, so at SUMA, I like to keep it simple. We like to keep it simple. Uh, and, and we go after what I like to say is low hanging fruit. We're focused in the southwestern US. There's some great jurisdictions in the southwestern US uh, and really going after these high grade districts, uh, which I think gives us a real, real good chance to have an early mover advantage in a lot of these places and take advantage of what I believe is, a, is going to be a very long bull market run for precious metals. So I like to start these things off just by introducing myself briefly. Uh, I'm a geologist going back about 15 years. Um, I was looking for a project and a deal for about two years before putting SUMA together. I wanted to find something that I could really sink my teeth into. I could spend years of my life building into a, a big win for myself and my shareholders. Uh, came, to, came to SUMA, came to the Hughes property in Nevada. Uh, but before I was doing that, I was managing all the drilling for a company called NextGen Energy in northern Saskatchewan. And we made multiple high-grade uranium discoveries. Uh, and before I was doing that, I was managing the exploration around a gold mine in Saskatchewan uh, called the CB mine. Uh, and we made a discovery that's now in production that'll, that'll end up probably being 2 million ounces or so. So none of that is to pat myself on the back by any means, but I just want to point out that as a geologist, I think when you've got two you know, pretty good technical wins under your belt, uh, it really gives you perspective. It really gives you a sense of scale uh, and teaches you about what to go after and what can work and what doesn't. So my whole approach to looking for projects uh, to potentially invest in and, and to work on is to look for that tier one potential. And that's what we're doing here at SUMA. The capital structure of the company, there's 51 million shares outstanding, 59 million shares fully diluted. We've done two financing since May. The first one was $5 million at 25 cents. Uh, and that was it in mid, in mid to late May. The second one was $8 million at a dollar with a dollar 75 warrant, half warrant, I should say, uh, and closed that in August. So $13 million so far. We've got a great shareholder base to start out of the gate and, and a very, very tight structure. The biggest shareholder is Eric Sprott at almost 18%. Uh, and then also a, some very strong institutional support uh, as well as management, uh, insiders and close associates own, you know, the bulk of the of the shares, those three groups together, uh, which really leaves us a, a small retail float to start, um, which is something that I'm uh, I'm working on now. I'm, I'm getting the word out on this company as much as I can. And that's why I'm doing presentations like this. So the first property is called the Hughes property. Uh, it's located in central Nevada, halfway between Reno and Las Vegas. Now, we all know Nevada as a famous gold producing jurisdiction. If it was if it was a country, it would be the fourth largest gold producer in the world or something like that. But what a lot of people don't know is that Nevada was originally known as the Silver State. And that's because of two Wild West classic American mining jurisdictions or, or camps, I should say, mining camps. The first one is the Comstock Lode uh, located up by Reno. And the second one is the Tonopah District. Uh, and that's where our Hughes property is. We have the eastern half of the Tonopah district. So Tonopah has a really interesting discovery story that I could probably talk about for you know half an hour. 
It was discovered in 1900 by a guy who was chasing after his runaway donkeys as he moved from the, through the desert from one ranch to the next ranch. Uh, and supposedly the runaway donkey stopped on top of the veins. Uh, now, I don't know if that's the true story, but it's a story. But in any case, at the end of the day, over 50 years, the district produced about 175 million ounces of silver and almost 2 million ounces of gold at grades of about 1250, 1260 grams per ton silver equivalent. So, you know, when I was first looking at this thing, I thought to myself, what could be, a, what's a comparable here? You know, what, what could we be in for if we're able to turn this into a win? And I kept coming back to a company like Silvercrest. You know, they go into an old district in Mexico that was mined 100 years ago and had a lot of past production, apply some really cutting edge modern exploration tools to that and get to work. Uh, they fire on all cylinders and deliver on, 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 every, on everything they do. But fast forward five years and they've got a market cap of $1.5 billion. So I just thought to myself, you know, something like that is a shot I want to take. Uh, and, and here we are today. So the property itself, uh, another interesting thing just about the history is that it was formerly owned by Howard Hughes, uh, the aviator, if anyone's ever seen that movie. And, and he's still a cult hero in the US today. Uh, so we called it the Hughes property just as a tip of the cap to the history. Uh, this was really one of America's great silver producers at the time in the 1910s and the 1920s. The main producing asset on the property is called the Belmont Mine, and it produced something like 40 million ounces of silver and 400,000 ounces of gold at grades of about 1,250 grams per ton silver equivalent. Uh, and this was from dozens of veins, you know, the best one being up to 15 meters wide. Um, and then the thing is here, you know, this hasn't had any modern exploration uh, at all. As far as we know, it's never been drilled until now. Uh, and we have some results to talk about here uh, coming up very, very shortly. So just a quick map of the property, the town of Tonopah is at the bottom left side uh, in here. And there's still something like two or 3,000 people living there. Uh, so the property surrounds the town of Tonopah to the east and to the north. And I'm just gonna zoom in to the Belmont Mine area right now. So the Belmont Mine, uh, some information on the mine on the left part of this slide, uh, but I like to concentrate on the right part of the slide. So the mine didn't shut down because it ran out of ore. It shut down for two reasons. At the end of the 1920s, silver and gold prices collapsed, number one. And number two, the veins ran into a fault zone called the Halifax Fault. And these are these red structures here. They ran into a fault zone and the old time miners lost the veins on the other side of that fault, more or less. Uh, so for me, there's really two interesting questions that remain. It's how much silver is left in the veins of the mine, just along extensions that they didn't get to mining 100 years ago, number one. Number two, how, many, how much silver is left for us to find on the far side of that fault? Okay, so what are we up to now? Uh, we started a 7,500 meter drill program at the beginning of July, uh, and, and that's gonna get us about 15 holes, give or take, um, with three main targets to start. And what we're looking at here is an underground figure. Uh, so on the left side of this figure, on the left side of this map, we've got the Belmont mine, uh, planning to drill six to 10 holes there. We've drilled seven. Uh, and this was just looking at extensions of veins that you know, weren't mined, that, never got, that, that the old timers never got to mining in the 1920s. So that's target number one. Target number two is the Mizpah extension mine. And back in this area, back 100 years ago or so, in, in 1915, the old time miners ran into some really, really high grades, uh, some very high grades, but they had some very poor ventilation in that area. So it wasn't mined on, on more than one or two levels. Uh, so we'll be drilling two holes there to test extensions to that. And this area has never been drilled. So we'll, be, we'll have the first two holes there in, in 100 years or ever. That's target two. Target three is move over another kilometer to the right called the Ruby target. And this one's interesting because in 1989, a company called Echo Bay drilled a few holes in this area. Uh, got some really interesting hydrothermal alteration, which is basically, you know, geology code word for some, some very interesting smoke. Uh, and then ET7 intersected four zones of mineralization, the best one being about a meter of 1500 grams per ton silver equivalent. Uh, and it was never followed up. 
So we're going to follow up there with uh, with one hole to see see what the system looks like uh, and try to find, locate those veins. Uh, so that was that was the the original plan. Now we got thrown a, a bit of a curveball in a good way uh, in July. Uh, so we have the eastern side of this district, uh, and another company has the western side of this district called BlackRock Gold. And BlackRock just presented earlier uh, earlier today. Um, now, the, the nice thing that happened, the upside for us was that BlackRock released a hole that was 29 meters at 965 grams per ton silver equivalent uh, in July. So a very, very high grade hole, probably one of the best holes of the year for silver. Uh, that was only 300 meters off of our property boundary to the west. So we're also going to explore that part of the property uh, and our drilling there right now. Okay, so some of the early results. Uh, Last week, I was very, very happy to share the results from the first three drill holes. All of them intersected high grades and were very strong. Uh, the highlight here that I like to point out is, is hole SUM2006. Uh, it intersected 596 grams per ton silver equivalent over 18 and a half meters, uh, including a high grade portion of 3,760 grams per ton silver equivalent over two and a half meters. Uh, so some very, very high grades, uh, and it's just very nice to be able to share that in the first ever drilling program into this mine since production shut down in the, in the late 1920s. Uh, so much more to come. Switching now just to view two of the holes, hole one and hole six underground in a long section view. And I just want to quickly point out with the pierce points here and here, that there is a lot of room around these holes to grow some high grade ounces. Uh, so we'll be following up on that in the very near future. So I'm just gonna skip a few slides here and please review these at your leisure. I now just wanna briefly touch on the property in New Mexico called Mogollon. So ever since we started SUMA back in, in April, May, you know, we've been looking for another property to augment our portfolio. You know, I'm of the opinion that we're in the early innings of a precious metal bull market that I, that I hope will last several years. Uh, so for me and for us, now is the time to be aggressive in our opinion. And that goes for you know, looking for new properties, exploration, financing. You know, now is the time to really step on the gas. So we optioned this property from a company called Allegiant Gold, uh, and they're concentrating on open pit style gold deposits in Nevada. Uh, so a high grade district like this, you know, something a high grade silver district, which is what this is, doesn't really fit their corporate uh, strategy. But of course, it fits ours almost perfectly. So this is another one of these historic districts that's never really seen the light of day, hasn't really had too much work done on it. Uh, production here shut down uh, in 1942 because that's when the U.S. entered World War II uh, and that's when all silver and gold mining in the U.S. stopped. Uh, so not much exploration since then, but where it is explored, there's some really interesting drill results. You know, so MGR 38 uh, just up in here had 14 meters of almost 60, 600 grams per ton silver equivalent and the very, very high grades are there as well. So MGR 18 a little ways to the south had 2.3 meters of almost 2000 grams per ton silver equivalent. So I took a look at this and I thought to myself, okay, well, where this is drilled just around some of the old mines, right beside some of the old mines, you're getting some very, very strong numbers. Uh, so there's some low hanging fruit, number one. Number two, well, where it's not drilled, it's not drilled. So there's a lot of blue sky potential in my opinion. Uh, and we're, so, we're, so we're pretty excited about this property. Well, we're spending maybe, you know, the time devotion and, and the resource devotion at this point is probably 90%, 80 to 90% in on the Hughes property in Nevada and 10 to 20% on the Mogollon property in New Mexico, this property. So we're working on it in the background and getting it ready to, to start drilling probably in the middle of next year. Okay, so just to summarize uh, the opportunity, Suma Silver, you know, we're looking at those famous high grade past producers that haven't seen the light of day. Uh, in the southwestern U.S., uh, again, you know, I, I really think a lot of these places have some excellent large-scale discovery potential, uh, and, and it's not a stretch for any junior company to tell you that you know they're looking for that next hundred million ounce deposit, and I think that's what we're doing. Um, so yeah, that's uh, I, I just want to I just want to say thanks everyone for for coming to the presentation.
Uh, we've got a lot of drill results coming out in the not too distant future and a lot for me and for the company to be excited about. Uh, so please uh, add us to your list. And uh, if you like the story, please consider building a position. Thank you, Galen. So uh, let's fire a few questions uh, sure. off to you from the audience. The first one here from Collinears, he's asking any need for additional financing in the near term, like six months or, or, or so? Yeah, so right now I'm, I'm fully financed with about $9 million in the bank, uh, fully financed to do a lot of drilling. But I think what could really change the story here uh, is if we're able to start pulling some, some big drill hole results. Uh, and in that case, I may want to change the scale of exploration and add more rigs. So in that case, I would consider another financing. Okay. And this one is interesting from Marx. He said, what's the toughest question Eric Squat has asked you about? <laughs> <laughs> the toughest question that he's asked me. Uh, I think it's, I think it's the, the focus on the technical aspects of the, of the old properties, you know, like, you know, we know that there's been a lot of past production here, but how can you show that there's still potential? Uh, how can you how, how can you show that the potential is still very good? And, and that really goes back to the legwork that we put into it uh, at the very start and spent a lot of time in the geology doing a doing a, a lot of 3D modeling of all of the veins and, and modeled up almost 100 separate veins in the on the Hughes property. So uh, so it so it takes a lot of work to, to show that there's still good potential. Uh, a lot of fundamental geology work. Sure. And this question coming from David is the Levada property. I think you went over a bit. The other half is from also uh, Black Rock Gold. I, I, I sort of maybe help him elaborate this question a bit. Maybe the ch any chance for uh, the consolidation later on if both of your projects looks really good on your uh, put, uh, results later on? I think that's a, that's a really interesting question. And uh, Andrew, the CEO of, of BlackRock and myself, you know, speak fairly regularly. Uh, definitely a positive relationship there. And, and hey, you know what I said was when it, it's so funny because this district was forgotten about for decades, you know, never looked at seriously for decades. And within a month, you've got two separate junior mining companies doing deals and drilling each half of, of this old district. So that for me was very surreal. Uh, I think in terms of, you know, the rest of the question, uh, from my perspective, you know, whatever's best for shareholders is, is what we want to do. Um, so I'm, I'm open to a lot of different possibilities for sure. Sure. There's one part you go one of the way. So when do we see some of your uh, latest drilling results? So they are coming out soon? Or? Yeah, yes, exactly. Uh, coming out near term in the next several weeks for sure. I would say, you know, the next couple weeks to month, we'll have more results to share with the markets. Sure. Another question coming from the, the, the another feed here. How's the infrastructure um, in the region? Um, so that's yeah, that's an, that's an interesting question. It it's it's very 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 good. I don't really know how else to put that. I mean, Nevada is you know one of the top mining jurisdictions in the world for a reason, for investment purposes for a reason. Uh, and for us, I mean, we're drilling right beside a town. There's a highway that runs between Las Vegas and Reno that goes through the property. You know, so and 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 also equivalent power uh, and very close to other mines in the area and other deposits. So in terms of infrastructure, it really doesn't get much better. Sure, just one final question here. He's asking about the exploration costs in US and Canada. Do you, are they quite similar in terms of the drilling or exploration cost? Yeah, exactly. They are quite similar. Uh, it, it, it helps a lot because access is very good uh, in, in Nevada and in New Mexico. You know, I've done a lot of exploration in Canada where we're having to use helicopters to, to drill holes and build our own camps. And when you're drilling right beside a town, you don't need to do any of that. So it makes it a lot simpler. Okay. Thank you, Galen, for all your time here, for answering the questions. Uh, uh, and thank you for joining us uh, today. Okay. Thanks a lot, Gilbert. And thanks everyone for joining.